There you go. Four punch, five punch, six punch combination. Body shot, body shot. Bang, 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 bang. Telling him not to counter punch. The top clean fight. Protect yourself at all times. Any questions in the challenge? Welcome back, fight fans, to the Fight City Podcast, the official podcast of thefightcity.com. Today, the Fight City is really excited to share their latest episode with you as we have Michael Carbert, fightcity.com founder, and Hunter Breckenridge, a regular contributor to our site, to discuss uh, Mike Tyson's career. Uh, especially as you consider that Mike Tyson, uh, as of recent, has agreed to uh, enter the ring with YouTube uh, sensation, if you will, uh, Jake Paul from Puerto Rico. Uh, some of you guys may say that this hurts the sport. Uh, Hunter, I think, brings a pretty good argument discussing how Jake Paul brings new eyes to the sport. Uh, however, this is a conversation that has tested the time uh, that the sport has even existed. Uh, because as the red light district of sports, uh, boxing champions have always uh, kind of taken a sidestep, sometimes for a little bit of a cash grab, uh, into facing opponents that we would never really consider them, I guess, taking on. For example, Muhammad Ali uh, getting in the ring with a Japanese wrestler. Uh, or, for example, I guess the latest uh, example I can think of with two professional fighters would be uh, Mike Tyson versus. Roy Jones Jr., or even Jake Paul versus Anderson Silva, a former UFC champion. Regardless, we hope you guys enjoy the episode. Uh, please leave a comment in our section and subscribe to the Fight City podcast for all things boxing related. This is Michael Kerbert of thefightcity.com. Happy to be with you. And I am joined now by site contributor Hunter Breckenridge. Hunter, great to have you on the podcast again. Great to be here. I'm looking forward to uh, our conversation today. Well, I know, uh, Hunter, you are, you're the only person I know of personally. Maybe there's a lot of them out there, but you're the only person I know of who's gone to all the trouble to rank, what is it again? The 200 best heavyweights of all time? Something like that? Uh, my, my, my list, uh, my initial list, uh, I, I narrowed it down to 200. So, uh, yeah, it's actually a little bit over that. But <laughs> but uh, I, I found myself at the top 200, and I, I was still still attempting to, to put together uh, – the actual, you know, little capsule reviews of each fighter in order. And uh, th that's been an endeavor more so than the actual ranking. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun little project. Well, needless to say, you're a, a, a boxing fan who really knows his heavyweights. And um, I imagine you may have something to say about a very unusual event that is scheduled to happen Although I, sh I, I should, I hasten to add these days now, it's maybe not so unusual. And really in terms of boxing history, it's not necessarily that unusual, but on July yeah. 20th, 2024 at the AT&T stadium in Arlington, Texas, if this goes through and who knows, maybe it won't, we're being promised that we will see a very, it, uh, a singular experience, I'll put it that way. One I don't think anyone anticipated happening or very few people thought might happen. And that is Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson. Now, there's a lot of details to be worked out. We still don't know how many rounds uh, the match is going to be or how long the, round, the rounds will be. Um, it's worth noting that the Mike Tyson, Roy Jones exhibition a little while back it was two minute rounds um so we don't know the details uh but it's being already promoted and mike tyson is definitely going out of his way to train for it and get ready and 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 promote it and he's saying this is a real fight um 
what do you make of this hunter i mean it it took me by surprise and i can't i can't say that i think it's you know i wouldn't i wouldn't say this is necess- necessarily a, a a sign of health when it comes to the sport of boxing um i find it uh dismaying on on more than one level uh what are your thoughts hunter I, 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 I share some of your dismay, certainly. Um, I, I'll say, though, that, and you kind of alluded to this earlier, in the, you know, the history of boxing, of course, has been replete with, uh, you know, quite a few clown show, you know, goofy, goofy sort of matchups and boxers versus wrestlers. You know, you had Ali versus Anoki. Uh, Archie Moore fought a... Uh, Mike DiBiase, I guess it was in a boxing match technically, but you know uh, how legitimate that was is kind of iffy. You know, a lot of the, a lot of these are. Um, it's not ha- having novelty fights and having this sort of scenario isn't that unusual. And of course, Mike Tyson himself is no stranger to weirdness in the boxing ring. Uh, I I. Overall, no, I, I don't think this is a great thing. I don't necessarily, you know, be, partly because boxing, you know, the whole red light district of sports, the Jimmy Cannon line, you know, has been this perpetual truth. It's basically an axiom uh, about boxing. And I, I think that I, 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 I don't think it's going to make things any weirder or worse. Really, uh, you know, Logan Paul is uh, Logan Paul. It's Jake Paul. See, I, I get these guys confused. Jake is the more legitimate fighter. And to a degree, he is. Although if you start to go through his, you know, resume, <laughs> it's, it's it's a little less impressive. And we can talk about that here. But I I think that he has drawn eyes to the sport, which isn't necessarily a terrible thing. Um, and it's it's not all been terrible publicity he's actually been it seems like as a promoter uh, from a promoting standpoint been pretty good for women's fighting uh women's boxing uh, i know i think it's amanda serrano has sung his praises as a as a promoter so there there's something to that uh him fighting the shell of mike tyson is a little bit of a surprise but I, I almost feel like with someone like Jake Paul, if you look at who he's fought so far, this someone, if not, if not Tyson, it would have been someone else like, you know, another faded fighter, maybe Roy Jones would have, you know, or something like that. I, I, I think uh, would have shown up at some point, the shell of a former grade is uh, the next logical step for him. If that makes sense. <laughs> well, yeah, I think there you can make the case that there really aren't a lot of options for Jake Paul um, after he lost a fight to um, help me out here, Hunter. Was it Tommy, Tommy Fury. Fury? Yeah. Yeah. Tom. Um, who is not highly regarded by anyone. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it was no surprise that Jake Paul would, would lose a fight against any, uh, Anybody. I mean, uh, Jake Paul does not have a background in boxing. He, he, he not didn't at all. Start, yeah. He's a celebrity who started boxing and he never had an amateur career. Um, we all know that, that, that generally speaking, you've got to start boxing young, you know, yep. any, any, if you start over the age of say 15, you're starting a bit late. Um, you, you're supposed to have an amateur career it takes years to develop the basic skills uh, and get anywhere close to an elite level um so jake paul has bypassed all that and um he's made a ton of money so he's already quite successful in the ring uh financially yeah um but but you know i mean he's not fooling anyone and he's not trying to fool himself he's not he's not on the road to actually you know, actual legitimate competition at the elite level. That's not going to happen. So, yes, something like this is really his only option. But in my mind, I never thought that, you know, Jake Paul, Mike Tyson, 
are they even anywhere remotely in the same weight class? I mean, the, what what weight was Jake Paul fighting at? Was wasn't it like a super middleweight or light heavyweight? Uh, uh, he's he's been a small cruiserweight. Uh, most of his fights have been in like w- around 185, 190, that range. Uh, I think his last fight was the heaviest. Uh, he fought, uh, actually, it was about a month ago, a month and a half ago, and it was 199. Uh, although his opponent, who was 197, just before that had been a light heavyweight. So again, he was not exactly feasting on similar size, great fighters, but it was a professional light heavyweight with a 17 and two or 17 and one record, something like that. So, you know, it was a club fighter level sort of guy, but it does seem like, I, I, I don't want to give him too much credit because no, I don't think this is a serious contending career. Uh, his last two opponents were at the very least actual legitimate professional fighters before that, other than Tommy Fury, who was probably the best fighter he's best boxer he's faced, which ouch, uh, no, no offense to Tommy Fury, but yeah, he's not exactly any sort of contender or anything. Uh, everyone else he's fought were washed up uh, MMA fighters, a basketball player, um, and the another YouTube guy, and that that's been about it. And uh, you know, he's largely one. He's he's acquitted himself well against those guys, and that's fine. So he's developed. He's put enough work in to at least be better than, uh, you know, an ancient Anderson Silva who doesn't box, or uh, Ben Askren or doesn't box, or a basketball player doesn't box and cool. But uh, yeah, you're right. It's uh, th- th- this is all just a you know a show. It's it's for money. It's uh, as as George Foreman used to say. It's all ballyhoo was his his word he loved, and uh, that's it's part of the sport. I don't love it. It's, it feels like a little bit of a distraction, especially because there are a bunch of good fights popping up this year, but <laughs> um, as far so no, he's going back to what you originally asked. So yeah, he's a small cruiserweight. He's six one and he's, you know, pretty stocky, strong guy, but uh, for a normal person who's not a professional boxer in any meaningful way, um, he's not tiny, but yeah, Mike, who, while a couple inches shorter, is, uh, you know, his prime was, what, 220, (laughs) 215, 220, and as an older guy, was more like 230, so there's, I I suppose, uh, Jake may be bulking up a little bit, I don't, I don't know any of the circumstances of how, what, if they have a, you know, catch weight they're going for, or anything like that, I, I haven't heard that, I haven't seen anything that far, but, uh, yeah, you assume that uh, Jake is definitely going to have a size deficit. But there's then the age deficit. And um, I took a few minutes to go back and look at the highlights of the Mike Tyson, Roy Jones uh, spectacle, another match that I wish hadn't happened. And, um, you know, Mike doesn't, he doesn't look bad. He doesn't look terrible, but he also doesn't look sharp either. He looks, he looks like a man in his mid fifties, you know, who's in terrific shape. But, you know, he doesn't have the speed. He doesn't have the explosiveness. He can't get the shots off that quick. Um, Yeah. You know, I I mean, it's – I really don't want to see Jake Paul beat up Mike Tyson. I really don't want that to happen. I'm hoping the fight doesn't happen. I hope hope something derails it. Um, But it's an intriguing – matchup between big names names that are big for different reasons and um it's a curiosity uh but otherwise um the negatives far outweigh the positives for me and i don't even want to really spend much time thinking about who's gonna win i just i just don't feel good whenever somebody in their 50s gets in the ring it just doesn't feel right to me Oh, I absolutely. I agree with that. And, uh, e- you know, even the, the, the legends of, uh, of, of geriatric fighting, uh, your, you know, your Archie Moore and Bernard Hopkins and George Foreman, it seemed like the upper minute, the upper limit for them was the late forties or around 50 ish or so when they either lost or retired or completely fell off. And I, and, and it's, it's not like Mike was, uh, 
had that sort of longevity either. And he wasn't anywhere close to those guys in terms of maintaining a, a high level over a long period. He, he was pretty washed, and especially compared to his prime by, you know, really, he wasn't the same after he you know, went to prison and he was what, 24 or 23 when that happened, something like that. So his, his, his prime uh, was, uh, uh, was pretty short, burned uh, bright and fast, you know, and I, I don't, as you said, yeah, he's in phenomenal shape for someone in his late fifties, but he's not a pro fighter and he's what is 30 years older than Jake Paul. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't like the idea of, if like like with uh with with Mike and Roy, there was definitely a certain respect. Neither went for the most part all that hard on each other. Uh, I, I I think there was a an understanding there that you know they're going to have some fun, be competitive, but they're not going to for the most part try to take each other's heads off. And I don't know if I don't know a lot about Jake Paul. I'm not a viewer of his YouTube channel. I never cared for any of that really, but. I, I would say I don't know if he's got that sort of intelligence or level of respect to basically have fun, make it a show, make it an exhibition. And I I feel like if he did, Mike, if if Mike has enough left to actually hurt him, he probably would let him off the hook at this point in his life. But I don't know. Yeah, a little part of me would love to see Mike just drop him with a left hook in the first minute and call it a day. That'd be fun. But I don't, yeah, I don't know if he can anymore, regardless of Jake's actual talent. It's, it's a weird proposition and it's hard to predict for me anyway. I, I don't know. And I don't kind of like you, I don't like the idea of really thinking too much about it. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's a very bizarre uh, proposition. And um, I mean, I, uh, I find Mike Tyson a fascinating figure for a few different reasons. And um, I'm really hoping that getting beat up by Jake Paul doesn't end up being a lasting final uh, uh, image of his, of his career. Um, Might as well. It's probably better to just think of this as not having anything to do with his career, which ended on a pretty low note when he, got beat up by, um, uh, now you would remember the name, Hunter McBride, I think. Uh, yep, da- uh, Kevin McBride. Uh, I wanted to say Kevin Danny McBride, McBride, but that's an actor. <laughs> yeah, Kevin McBride, always- the, uh, the the Colossus from, I forget where it was in Ireland, but yeah, big dude. Yeah, and, um, and Mike uh, went down uh, and didn't get up. And he basically said, I'm finished. I just, my heart's not in this anymore. And he retired. And, um, and then, you know, years later, uh, he reinvented himself and, you know, kudos to him. Uh, At the time before that, a lot of us were expecting a very unhappy ending to the Mike Tyson story. He was a a very angry and self-destructive individual and he turned his life around and became this new and different and very likable person. I, I you know, again, I, I just, I don't know. He doesn't need to be doing this, it seems to me. He doesn't need to be getting back in the ring at the advanced age of 57 or 58. Um, so, yeah, I, I part of me really ho- hopes that uh, this fight doesn't come off at all. But... Um, but you being the expert on heavyweights, if I may, Hunter, uh, one of the things that I find very interesting about Mike Tyson's career looking back is how it began in 1985 and through 1986. And I think, you know, decades later, uh, many people may forget his, his entry into the pro ranks especially in the context of boxing in the 21st century was nothing short of phenomenal. I mean, in 1986 alone, I believe he fought something like 13, 14 times. And, and he just, he just invaded the division and knocked off one contender after another fighting on almost a monthly basis. I mean, it it causes one to wonder can a fighter even have a career like that? 
in today's version of boxing? Well, I mean, you know, you, you've got, you do have the careers of the sort of blue chip prospects who still sort of, go, you know, there are people who go through the ranks, they have their, you know, five to 10 fights against people losing records, and then five to 10 fights kind of going up through the, you know, the local fringe contenders and that kind of thing. There, There is a process that's kind of, that's sort of time honored for that. And I think there are examples of it, certainly, even now. I will say that the way the way Mike did it, especially the, as you said, you know, fighting, I, I think he had, uh, it was something like going into his fight with Trevor Burbick, he had, I think, 26 or 27 pro fights in just under two years. Yeah, so it was very aggressive. Um, that was a lot more, yeah, as you said, that was a lot more common back then to have a dozen fights or more in your first year, uh, fighting once a month, really getting that experience, getting in the ring a lot. You may not, you know, you may not be fighting to start with killers, but you're gaining valuable experience and you're gradually ramping up the competition as he did. Uh, there are, there are a few heavyweights who fought tougher competition earlier, but he, he had he was already a pretty accomplished amateur and certainly had a lot of that foundation and he going to the pro ranks uh starting out before he fought for his first title a lot of these names that pop up were you know a gradual improvement over you know fighting ha- having a fairly competitive fight a fairly tough fight against Quick Tillis uh in May of 86 Mitch Green right after that, also a decision that was good for him. He needed that. Uh, there, were, you know, there were a few examples, uh, kind of backtracking a little, but yeah, all the way up until his first title fight and at the end of '86 with Burbick, who who had a title and was a legit top ten heavyweight at that point, and he just obliterated him. But he he got there by building himself up and gaining that experience. And while it was only two years, it was a very busy uh very you know there's his learning curve was steep and uh he, his he they his his handlers his people uh customato and kevin rooney and at least at that point put himself in a position where he was ready for a guy like verbic after less than two years and that's yeah you do, you definitely don't see that sort of progress very often uh especially at heavyweight march from march of 1985 <laughs> Mm. March of 1985 to November of 1986, 28 fights. There you go. 28 fights. 26, I believe, 26 victories by knockout. And the final 28th win for a world title knocks out Trevor Burbick in the second round and is the youngest heavyweight champion of all time, a record that I believe will probably never be broken, a 20-year-old heavyweight champ. Um, you know, it's a phenomenal run. And, and again, I just feel that, that um, I mean, it was extraordinary even for then. And it just seems to me that, um, you know, the stars would have to be aligned so perfectly for any heavyweight prospect to be able to put together a run like that. And, and as you point out, get the kind of experience against seasoned pros uh, that you need to be able to succeed at the top level. Um, I'm not sure who was more responsible for the matchmaking, whether it was uh, Kevin Rooney and Customato or was it uh, Jim Jacobs and uh, Bill Caton? I, maybe it was all of them working together. But it really is uh, an extraordinary um, accomplishment how quickly he moved up through the ranks, faced, a, you know, they weren't all pushovers by any means. Um, oh yeah, guys like Jose Ribalta and Alfonso Ratliff, and uh, and of course the unforgettable uh, knockout on I don't I don't believe it was primetime television, but it was on ABC's Wide World of Sports, if I remember correctly. He took on Marvis Fraser, son oh, yeah. of world champ Joe Fraser, and just demolished him in 30 seconds flat. And that definitely had an impact on the general public. So by the time he defeated Trevor Burbick for the world title, he was already a major star. He was a sports star, not just a boxing star. Um, 
it's really, I think, an extraordinary um, rise. Uh, he, as you mentioned, he was a, an accomplished amateur, um, but still, uh, in terms of the general public and, and, and general sports fans, it must have seemed like he came out of nowhere. Absolutely. Yeah, it, yeah, it did happen very quickly. Uh, for the most part, uh, most of the best heavyweights of the past you know, 20 plus years had kind of a slower rise and sort of crept more into public consciousness. Some of them may have had pretty, you know, great amateur careers. For example, there were, you know, Olympic gold medalists, especially some of the ones coming out of the former Soviet Union, that, that some of those guys, your uh, Klitschko's and Povetkin's and people like that. And then you had some that, or someone like Lennox Lewis, you know, people, people came out of the Olympics and kind of worked their way. And, and, and a little, it took a little longer um, to really get going and really, and, and none of them, of course, one thing about Tyson while he may not be as great as the greatest, uh, and we can get into that in a little bit, I, I wouldn't, I put him on my list significantly below some of his contemporaries like Lennox Lewis and uh, Evander Holyfield in terms of overall career accomplishments. But at the time he came out into, you know, sort of became a public figure and became known, not only did he have huge crossover appeal and a boxer could still do that uh, pretty readily, he also, I, I think a lot of it is just, he was he was pretty likable and charismatic when he was young. He had a certain sort of shy uh, charm to him before some of his demons started to uh, become a lot more public, of course. But also, he, he knocked people out. He had he was he had quick hands. He had these explosive combinations. He looked terrifying when he was in a good when he was in a flow when he was landing uh, when he when he'd actually start connecting with someone. Uh, I, it really captured, I think, the public's imagination because if you're going to watch boxing, you want to see a knockout. I think, especially for some people who are more kind of casual fans. I don't say that in a pejorative way. I mean, just the average person who maybe enjoys a fight now and then isn't going to watch a a, a chess match. You know, they're they're in there to see someone get knocked out, and someone like Mike Tyson, boy, was he able to fulfill that more often than not. Uh, and there certainly were some examples of fighters who could frustrate him in times he couldn't knock people out. And we can talk about that, too. But especially those first two years, all you saw was him just obliterating guys. And it was it was terrifying and impressive. And uh, I it, it's even when you've had uh, more recent fighters knocking opponents out and there are certainly guys who can hit, no doubt uh, it. It, it didn't have the same sort of visceral impact. Maybe some of that was because he was also so small for a heavyweight and he had to really get in there and uh, get close and swing those fast, short hooks. Uh. As you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, his, his prime was relatively short. Um, and I think there are uh, several different factors contributing to that. Um, obviously, one of them was the Don King factor. His original management team seemed to have his best interests at heart, seemed to have him on track, and were taking care of him. Uh, then Don King gets in there, then Robin Givens gets in there, and things start to fall apart almost immediately. As soon as Kevin Rooney, um, who was also a disciple of Customato, um, and was his main trainer during the early part of his pro career. Uh, as soon as, as Kevin Rooney's gone, you can almost instantly see um, a devolution in, in Tyson's technique. I believe his first fight without Kevin Rooney was uh, a title defense against Frank Bruno, uh, 1988, I believe. Um, yep. Or no, 89, I think. And, uh, yeah. um, and right away, you could see he just wasn't quite as sharp um, in terms of his technique. And um, I wouldn't say his, his prime was, was finished right there, but uh, definitely, you know, the performances which followed weren't as good. He didn't seem as, as sharp. Um, what, what, how would you characterize, how would you pinpoint Tyson's peak where do you see it what 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 are the what are his best performances the ones you would point to if someone were to someone were to ask you 
where 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 do I go if I want to see Mike Tyson at his absolute best? Which fight do I crank up on YouTube? Oh, uh, Burbick would have to be a, a, one of the top few. Uh, that was again, that was sort of his coming out party to the world. Uh, Larry Holmes. Uh, Larry Holmes was uh, that was in '88, uh, January '88, and that was obviously against of the, his first real great opponent. Uh, obviously, Larry had been Larry had been on the shelf for a couple of years after having lost to Spinks and was definitely not what he had used to be. But considering what Larry Larry's career in the 90s, which was hit and miss at times, but because he was able to extend his career and have some impressive wins in the 90s, if anything, that makes uh, Mike's obliteration of him uh, in 88 look all the better. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, I, again, I think that's, there's a lot of factors there. I don't think a prime Larry would have gone out quite that way. And you could even see flashes early in that bout where Larry certainly showed some of his, you know, showcased some of his skills uh, and, and made Mike's life a little tough before he caught up to him. But actually, if I would say probably the absolute most impressive uh, fight had to have been against Spinks. Uh, and Spinks himself probably was would never have been a great match. You know, I feel bad for Michael Spinks because I don't like the fact that for a lot of people, he's remembered for getting obliterated in 90 seconds by Mike Tyson because he was an all-time great light heavyweight before that. Uh, while he didn't do a whole lot at heavyweight, he did capture the heavyweight title. At least his first fight with uh, Larry Holmes, I thought, was at least a fair enough decision. The second one is a, a lot more disputed, but um, but Spinks could fight, and he had bulked up to a small heavyweight in a way that he wasn't. He 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 wasn't. There were people at the time who said he might even be a bit of a threat to Tyson, and obviously he did not come into the fight with a lot of confidence uh, that that was very clear. And he's talked about that too. Uh, but the way Mike just handled easily at that point, other than Larry Holmes, the most accomplished opponent of his career, I, I think that would probably be the one I'd probably put all three of them together. If, if I was going to point to someone just because that's still, <laughs> you know, that's still only about six total rounds of fighting. <laughs> so, because uh, yeah. again, at, at that point he was so sharp, and yeah, immediately after the Spinks fight was Frank Bruno, and uh, not immediately. I mean, it was uh, about eight months later, and yeah, there was, had been a lot of upheaval in his life, and you could see. And Bruno himself, uh, Bruno could punch. In fact, that was the one thing he was good at. He he had a he he, he hurt Mike early in that fight, and Mike looked pretty sloppy. And uh, Frank's biggest weakness is. His chin wasn't great, but honestly, I think for him, it was more his confidence. And uh, he was probably the wrong type of guy mentally to go in against a Tyson. But uh, but yeah, you could start to see things unravel kind of beginning around then. So I think Spinks was probably his absolute. That, that would be the one I'd say. Watch out if you want to see how terrifying Mike Tyson was at his absolute best. It's difficult to argue that point. Uh you know, I mean, you look you, on paper, there's no doubt Tyson's best opponent has to be Michael Spinks. I mean, Holmes was inactive for three years. Um, who else is in the in the running? I mean, Pinklon Thomas was an accomplished fighter, and yeah. the finish uh, Thomas... the finish of that fight is is very impressive. You just go back. I mean, the whole fight. Pinklin Thomas actually has his moments. He gives he gives Tyson some some decent competition, but then yeah. Tyson turns it on in round six, and my God, it's a it's a it's a <laughs> very impressive two fisted demolition. Um, uh, Absolutely, that's uh, I, that's up there for me. And then now Tyrell Biggs was never going to defeat Mike Tyson, no. but neither was Michael Spinks, really. When you think about no. it, I mean, but uh, Tyrell Biggs, um, big, strong heavyweight uh, with some skills, and Tyson just methodically demolished him. You know, uh, so I would I would throw that that performance in there too. But you know, like you like you said a, a minute ago, it, you you look at his best wins. If the best wins are Burbick, Spinks, and Holmes. That's a grand total of not even 
barely seven rounds. Yeah. And and this is the thing. This is the thing that maybe some Mike Tyson fans don't seem to get. Is he one of the great heavyweight champions of the last few decades? No doubt about it. But is he an all-time great? I mean, uh, the the it, the record is just a little thin. I mean, he never faced another all-time great in close to their peak. Um, he never had to come. He never came back from adversity in a fight. In my, I would argue, he never came from behind. He never overcame adversity in the ring to win. You know, his his all time best opponents are, you know, the the fighters that we just discussed, and then you could maybe throw in uh, Donovan Ruddick, uh, maybe one or two others. I mean, the record just isn't that solid in terms of comparing him to all-time greats, at least in my opinion. Oh, yeah, I, I definitely agree. I, I, He was putting together a solid run in the late 80s, and there's, there's, there's been a lot of debate. I've seen a lot of debate about exactly how strong that era was, but it, it's just, I think, objectively true that it was bracketed by stronger eras. The, through the 90s, which, of course, Mike spent the first half of that decade or, or most a big chunk of that decade not even able to fight for obvious legal reasons. And uh, it was a strong, but that was a stronger period, both with and without him. And then, of course, in the 70s, before he got going, was a stronger era. Uh, he and, and, you know, you can't control your era, obviously. And, and I think for the most part, especially during that run, basically from 86 through 90, he, he, for the most part, I think, fought the most of the best available competition. I think his only real misses in terms of, and you're not, and even great fighters aren't going to get them all. But I, I think, you know, I would say his only real misses would probably have been Tim Witherspoon, uh, you know, people like that. Uh, and I, who we probably would have been, uh, Tim Witherspoon was one of those guys who could be almost brilliant when he was on, but was super inconsistent. Uh, I, I think he would have obviously been favored, but I, I would have liked to see that fight. Maybe someone like Jerry Ketsey or guys of that nature who he would have also probably obliterated. Um, I, so, so I think he, he definitely had more that he, you know, more opponents that he actually faced uh, than missed. Um, I, I, but as far as who was available for him to fight, yeah, it, it was okay. It, it wasn't the worst era ever. It certainly wasn't the strongest. And while he did fight most of whom was there to fight, uh, who was who that was who was available for him to fight, I and you can't necessarily blame him for his era, as he did have chances to step up later on. Uh, obviously. A lot of people will point out, well, he was well past his prime when he fought Evander Holyfield. He's well past his, even more past his prime when he fought Lennox Lewis. So are they. Uh, <laughs> Evander, I, I believe, is older than Mike, and uh, Lennox is right there, too. Uh, and it's not like they, they definitely, their primes lasted longer. They definitely had much better longevity. But that's also in their favor against Mike. You know, it's not it's not their fault. Mike uh, burned himself out a lot sooner. So, and yeah, when he did step up and face those two legitimate all time, great hall of fame heavyweights. Yeah. He, he wilted. And I, we can talk about this if you want. I, I I'll say that while he obviously Holyfield was definitely in a stronger position in his career than Mike was when they did eventually fight. And we've talked before about uh, the missed opportunities, how they could have fought in 90 and then 91, and it didn't happen for different reasons. Uh, I'm To this day, I am still not convinced uh, Mike ends up being, beating. I, I, I think Holyfield would have beaten him regardless. I, I think that was just a guy who always had Mike's number. As good as Tyson could be, uh, Holyfield was, Holyfield's will alone would have kept him in it, and his his speed and skills and counterpunching ability and ability to negate Mike's offense, I think, would have just been always too much for him. He may not have stopped him in 1990, but I think he would have won at least a decision. So, uh, but yeah, so so Mike, my, my, Mike's resume isn't terrible. Um, my 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 personal top ten, my personal top two hundred ranking has him in the top twenty, but not the top ten, if that means anything. So, yeah, that that sounds fair to me. I mean, I, he he 
he doesn't crack the top 10 for me either. Um, one, one name that I think does bear mentioning when we're talking about opposition uh, mm. that I think we'd be remiss to not, to not bring up is uh, Tony Tucker. Tony Tucker yeah. was, a, was one of the better heavyweights of the 1980s, and that's one of Mike's best wins uh, as well. Um, but, uh, you know, the Hollyfield fights are very interesting. They will always be fascinating. Uh, obviously the, the second fight will never be forgotten. Um, the bite fight. Uh, but the first match is also so intriguing, uh, in many respects, one of which being that there seems to be a certain amount of, uh, revisionist history going on about the fact that, I mean, Mike Tyson was a huge favorite to win that fight, like massive. I mean, uh, people seem to forget, I guess, because Hollyfield went on after that fight to have a number of, of big paydays and, and uh, a pair of fights with Lennox Lewis and, and so on and so forth. But in the days leading up to the first Tyson Hollyfield fight, there was legitimate concern for Hollyfield's welfare. And when the match was first announced and you get all kinds of people uh, when this is at, whenever this is mentioned, you get all kinds of people speaking up and saying, no, that's, that's BS. It's just a rumor. Legitimately, the betting odds when the fight was announced were in the neighborhood of 20 and 25 to one. You can look it up. There were, there are Vegas, Las Vegas uh, betting publications that talk about this at the time. Now, very quickly, those odds disappeared, but that's how, much of a long shot Evander Holyfield was considered before that first fight back in 1996. And uh, I find it so interesting that I don't know why people don't, some people it's, these days seem to dismiss that as, as hyperbole. Uh, I assure you, um, as somebody who remembers vividly the two Tyson Holyfield fights, that first match was a massive upset it's it it will it has to be ranked as one of the all-time greatest uh upsets in the heavyweight division absolutely yeah i'm looking here and it's saying that it definitely it opened that bout opened up as a 25 to 1 holyfield is the underdog and it closed it closer to six to one but which is still significant five or six to one um and yeah if, if you bet on evander you would have made some money uh I, and I, I think I read, I'll have to find it, um, but I remember seeing something like out of 50 members of the media, only one predicted a Holyfield win. Um, I, uh, and, and, I, and I, I remember that fight and uh, just celebrating. Uh, I, I, was, I was a Holyfield fan, and in general, I just liked the idea of the under, I didn't like Mike Tyson much, and I liked the idea of the underdog taking him out, but while I wanted Mike to win, yeah, I am not Mike Evander to win. I wasn't. I wasn't very confident. I don't think anybody was, uh, or very few people were. And yeah, my uh, Evander hadn't looked very good. He certainly had beaten better competition and fought better competition in recent years at that point. But he had just gone through, um, you know, a gauntlet. You know, he had fought Riddick both three times, losing two of them, and had just recently been stopped by Riddick in their third fight. Uh, he had tough fights against. Foreman and Burt Cooper and Larry Holmes and Alex Stewart and Michael Moore, uh, Ray Mercer and him had a great fight and he actually looked a little better against Ray, but uh, he, and then Bobby Chez, who honestly didn't make him look very good either. <laughs> it was, you know, he had a, a, a Vander, a Vander wasn't a lot of people thought he was more or less done or getting close to done. And I think at that point, Tyson, his comeback from prison, I, 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 you, you actually use this phrase, and I think uh, in our last uh, conversation, I think this is about right. It was a bit of a mirage. Uh, his opposition, while not terrible, was uh, certainly not to the level that Holyfield had been facing. And uh, you know, Buster Mathis Jr. Uh, terrified and already defeated Frank Bruno, Bruce Selden, who I'm not sure if even landed that shot. <laughs> that that it took out Selden. That was strange. And then of course McNeely does that. That that wasn't a big deal because that was his first fight back. But I th that wasn't 
you know, on paper, it looks fine if you're not paying any attention to the actual substance of the fighters. But yeah, I think a lot of people were looking at Mike Tyson as they remembered him from his prime. And they were looking at Holyfield as they thought, as a guy they thought it was on the decline. And so, yeah, the the, the predictions were all, Evander was going to die, you know, basically, or could get badly hurt. And a lot of, yeah, as you said, a lot of people worried for his health. And you're right, it was a huge upset. I, I was a freshman in high school when that fight happened, and uh, to date myself a little bit. And I remember specifically that Monday coming into school and all of the talk just being about what the, what happened to Tyson and is, is Holyfield a legit contender or is Tyson now useless? And it was, it was, it was quite the, uh, the chatter about that. It, it was actually pretty exciting to me. So. <laughs> and then uh, jump ahead yep. a few decades and, you know, the, there was actually a bit of hype for a possible, Mike Tyson Evander Holyfield trilogy fight. Oh yeah, when the Tyson uh, Roy Jones Jr. Uh, exhibition match happened. Um, thankfully, it it did not uh, yeah. materialize. Absolutely. And, um, but you know, I I personally was not happy when Tyson and Roy Jones got in the ring and did what they did. I, I felt it was symptomatic of a, of a sport that's struggling to stay relevant. And here we are, you know, I, I, it's, it's some, it's months away, which is very interesting. Um, it's not slated to happen until July, but Jake Paul, Mike Tyson to come full circle. What, what does this really say Hunter about, boxing today and specifically about the heavyweight division especially when we have a very intriguing high stakes match coming up uh next month uh alexander usik versus tyson fury hopefully it doesn't get uh, postponed again um but obviously there's still an appetite for mike tyson mike tyson's still uh attracts a lot of attention and generates a lot of revenue. I'm not sure what to make of it or, or what the, what this says about heavyweight boxing uh, today. I, I, I think it, I think it, it certainly says some negative things about heavyweight boxing today, but I, I also think it's more, I think there's a combination of that, but it's not just that because like looking at the heavyweight division now, it's, it's never incredibly strong, except in certain pockets of time. Uh, The heavyweight division is one of those that even when it is strong, you often see people complaining. I've been compiling a list of every single instance I could find of a media person complaining about the heavyweight division in the nineties, but now retroactively, most people agree that was a strong era. So, you know, nobody's ever completely satisfied or rarely when, when things are actually occurring, but I'll say that there's, there's some actually some actual intriguing fights. Yeah. There's obviously the big one coming up, um, with uh, Tyson Fury and Alexander Usyk and Anthony Joshua and Joseph Parker have both sort of reinvigorated their careers. Uh, you know, you've got, uh, Deontay Wilder, who is probably, uh, is definitely on the downhill slide, but he's got another fight with another fellow top 10 contender. You've got some names coming up. It's, it's not like the heavyweight division is completely, completely dead or useless either. There's, there are some good things there. I think, And there have been some, there's certainly been some good fighters since Mike Tyson's day, but I do think there is a nostalgia. People, people remember, you know, he, he was a celebrity in the sense, in a way that no other heavyweight since him have managed to be, you know, people who aren't boxing fans may have heard of Evander Holyfield or Lennox Lewis or even Vladimir Klitschko, but they don't know them very well. And they, they certainly, and all of those guys are generally have had better, you know, better public images too. And I think, I hate to say it, but I think some of it, Mike Tyson's various trials and tribulations and of course, abhorrent behavior, uh, as well as his, you know, more recent public rehabilitation, 
have I, I think that's the type of thing that captures the public's imagination in a way that there's just there's a lot of charisma there and it it could be an indictment on boxing to a certain degree and on the heavyweight division but some of it's also just people people like people are nostalgic people like you know the memories of the past the things that they grew up watching and the 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 youtube they've carefully curated youtube clips showing that final combination against pinkland thomas and not him struggling to to get shots off against quick tillis or whatever you know what i mean and it's i i think that even when there's been I think bo- it's less about the heavyweights and more about boxing in general. And we've we've talked ad nauseum and about the overall decline of boxing. And there's so much to that. The you know the the, the amateur system shrinking down. A, a lot of North American based, especially U.S. based stuff. So uh, you know there's just much less interest in boxing now in, in there. And even in other pockets of the world where where there's still interest, it's it's not consistent, you know, and I, the, the overall decline of the sport has to be part of it. So people remember a guy who was big when the sport was big, uh, when there were more crossover stars. And I, I don't know what the solution is beyond continuing to try to talk up the good stuff that does happen. The, Fury Usyk is an important fight and we should celebrate it happening and we should talk a lot about it and hopefully we'll have a conversation about it too. But uh, I, it's for whatever reason, uh, a loud mouth from YouTube and a guy who stopped being a uh, top heavyweight uh, back when George HW Bush was the U S president. Uh, <laughs> um you know, uh, th- those are still the the ones getting all the attention. I I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Last question, Hunter. If it comes off, Mike Tyson versus Jake Paul uh, in Texas in July, are you going to watch it? Yes and no. I I probably I, I don't even know if it's going to be if it's pay per view. Definitely not. Uh, I don't even know that. I, I th- this is. Uh, me as a bad boxing fan, I even haven't even checked that far, but I probably won't watch it as it happens. I'll probably catch it on YouTube the week after. That's some, sometimes fights like this. Is that, that's how I end up going. What about you? Oh, I don't have time. I don't have time for that nonsense. <laughs> no, not going to happen. No. Uh, understood. Well, this has been great, Hunter, and I agree with you. We will have to catch up again uh, in the near future and talk again definitely, about uh, Tyson Fury versus Alexander Usyk, either before or after. So that's for the future. And uh, as always, Hunter, thank you for joining me on the FightCity.com podcast. Thank you for having me. Hey everyone, it's Jeff here. If you liked today's episode, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and check out all of our other content on thefightcity.com. The website link can be found in our show notes. Till next time.